I first just wanted to thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon for our workshop on Don't Get Caught in the Dark Again. Uh, for those of you that are looking for the Spider-Man performance, that's, uh, you're, you're in the wrong spot here. Um, I'm Eric Friedman. I'm with uh, Wilmer Hale, a law firm uh, that has recently uh, relocated downtown. I'm the director of facilities with the firm. Um, I just wanted to um, first just thank all of you for attending and certainly thank the, uh, the panelists um, for the uh, time that they've put into this. We think it's a, a great informative session on um, disaster recovery, business continuity. We've certainly seen a lot of these types of, a lot of, these types of events uh, recently and we've, um, you know, we continue to learn from them and we hope that there's uh, some valuable takeaways. Uh, just a few, um, uh, I guess, more, more business notes on uh, Cornet and upcoming uh, information. The May workshop is uh, set for May 1st. It's on corporate real estate benchmarking. It's going to be held at the Steelcase showroom. Uh, the workshop will serve as a high-level overview uh, on the processes of benchmarking and data collection, emerging trends, and the value and effects of benchmarking in the future. So we hope you can join that, and we will be um, obviously sending out e-blasts and notifications shortly. Uh, this year's Eastern Regional Symposium should be especially interesting for those of you that are here today. The theme of the workshop, uh, I mean of the um, symposium is resilience. It will be held on June 17th and June 18th at uh, Wharton in Philadelphia. Um, it's a great value, two, day, two full days of programming, end user fee is $195, uh, and the New York City chapter will offer scholarships for those that attend. Uh, we encourage you to um, book quickly. The inn at Penn tends to fill up uh, quickly, and um, the best time to obviously register for both the hotel and the symposium is now, so please uh, go ahead and do that if you're interested. Um, today we have uh, Michelle Johnson here from the Office of Energy Management. Thank you, Michelle. Um, please feel free to stop by at the end, grab a bag. Michelle has some great information on uh, the city's responses to um, these types of events and, 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 real, uh, and other real helpful information. So uh, please stop by, see Michelle. Michelle, thank you again. Um, just wanted to introduce today's moderator. Um, Alan DeShillo is a uh, colleague of mine. Um, Alan is with uh, Sherman and Sterling. He's the director of global real estate. Uh, he's also a member of their firm's BCP SWAT team. Um, I uh, tend to uh, reach out to Alan a lot for uh, advice on all types of um, uh, facilities and operations matters that we do in the legal industry. Uh, Alan's firm also hosts the Cornet Legal Roundtables, um, uh, which have been uh, very valuable for, uh, for the members that, are, that participate in that. So thank you, Alan, for that. Uh, a little background on Alan. Alan uh, was a real estate attorney at Morgan Stanley, where, among other deals, he was responsible for the largest lease at World Trade Center, a million square feet. Worked on real estate and insurance issues following the 1993 bombing and the 9-11 attacks. He's an adjunct professor at NYU's Master's in Real Estate program, uh, co-author of the Treatise Negotiating and Drafting Office Leases, elected to the American College of Real Estate in 2003, and also a former chair of the American Bar Association's uh, Leasing Committee. He is a former New York City chapter president, president of NACOR and a member of the Global Board instrumental in the merger between NACOR and IDRC. And Alan also is a frequent speaker on commercial real estate issues, uh, particularly insurance, casualty, business continuity, and leasing issues. And Alan, we thank you for uh, hosting or moderating today and uh, look you. forward to the panel. Good. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for attending because this is an extremely important topic as we see in our world of real estate. Um, and I appreciate Cornet for giving us the opportunity of having this as a forum. At our firm at Sherman & Sterling, we have a saying um, that this is always number 11 on everybody's list of 10 items. Uh, when I lecture, either through lawyers at Practicing Law Institute or my class at NYU, and we talk about casualty insurance issues, I always warn everybody that you know there's nothing more boring, dull, than doing casualty insurance clauses and, and going through casualty insurance issues, but nothing more gut-wrenching than getting that call on a Friday afternoon that there's been a fire, a flood, a bombing, a plane in the building, a hurricane, anything like that. So it's something that is not on anybody's top priority list, so it takes a lot of planning and work on it. And we have an excellent 
group of experts. We're going to take you through each aspect of this very important topic and wrapping it up with the head of our BCP plan, Tony Reeve, at Sherman and Sterling to give it an overall idea of what it's like to run an organization like that. Our first speaker is Ellen Storch, who's a partner with the law firm of Kaufman Dolowitz in um, Long Island. She represents clients in all areas of employment law. She defends international, national, local employees. In addition to litigating on behalf of clients, she gives daily advice on the, the wide range of laws that govern and affect real estate relationships. She lectures regularly on employment law issues on a variety of organization. She has served as an adjunct professor at the New York Institute of Technology. She's a member of the National Association of Insurance Women and Labor and Employment Section. And prior to joining Kaufman Dolowitz, she was an associate the, at a New York law firm, which is very familiar to us, where she concentrated on employment law. Please join me in welcoming Ellen on this very important topic of labor relationships and employment issues in business continuity. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, one thing Alan didn't I, uh, mention is that the national law firm that I started at in the city was Sherman and Sterling. So, <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, I may need an IT specialist to help me with this disaster recovery. I, I how do I get to my PowerPoint? <laughs> Um, there's a printout of my PowerPoint in the blue folder that hopefully you received. And how do I click through it? Okay. Sorry. Okay, we actually set that up just to show you how smoothly <laughs> things, things can run. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly during these, uh, the 10 minutes that I have and just cover an overview of some of the important HR employment law issues to be mindful of when dealing with any kind of disaster that will affect your workforce. I'm going to cover communicating with employees, uh, how to pay employees, be mindful of the wage and hour laws even through the, the worst types of disasters and the legal obligations with respect to leaves that you have to or may have to permit employees. And then a quick overview of some ways to set up assisting employees who suffer during disasters. Communicating with employees during any type of business interruption, I gave a couple of suggestions of a call-in number or having a portal on your website uh, I'm sure that there's lots of other ways that you do have in place and can think of. The point I wanted to bring forward with this is that having alternative methods of communicating with employees in case the cell phones don't work, the Blackberries don't work, the company website is down, the call-in number is down, just having alternatives in place is, is really the most important idea. And letting employees know ahead of time in, let's say, an emergency preparedness portion of your employee handbooks or elsewhere, this is how we will communicate with you in the event of a disaster. There's uh, such a prevalent use of social media today, and I know it's such an important way for people to communicate during a disaster. As a management side employment lawyer, the idea of using something like Facebook to communicate with employees just scares the living hell out of me because it is so fraught with potential liability issues. I like very much the idea of employer being able to communicate with employees, but being able to control the message and being able to control how people respond to the message. Uh, Facebook has, has just changed the entire face of employment litigation today, and the idea of employees being able to post in response to employer posts is, is really just brought with liability for employers. So my view is anything but that. How do you pay employees when they miss work? 
they may miss work because they can't show up, they may miss work because your operations have shut down. Whatever the case may be, there is a significant difference between your payment obligations to those employees who are exempt, meaning not eligible for overtime, those who are paid a salary, <coughs> and those who are non-exempt, meaning they're paid by the hour, they're eligible for overtime for our, all hours worked over 40 in a week. With respect to non-exempt workers, you have to pay them for every hour worked. You don't have to pay them for any hour not worked, whatever the reason may be. So if you come up with arrangements where if your business is shut down and they can work remotely during a disaster, make sure that you have in place some mechanism for them to track the hours, the time that they've worked, and that you're paying them for all time worked. And being mindful that if they can make it into the office, if, if operations are ongoing, you're likely going to be short-staffed. So if you have non-exempt workers who are working over 40 hours, working longer shifts than they normally may be, be mindful that all of the wage and hour laws that are in place during uh, non-disaster times are certainly in place during, during times of emergencies. So if they're working over 40 hours in a week, you have to pay them time and a half for all the hours over 40. If they're unable to get to the work or operations are shut down, you may permit them to use any accrued and paid leave like vacation or sick leave that they have available, but you're not obligated to. Uh, with respect to exempt workers, these are salary people who get paid a set salary no matter how few or how many hours they work in a week. Um, if an exempt worker works any part of a week, whether it's 15 minutes, an hour, or 60 hours, they have to be paid for the entire week. So in the case of uh, Sandy, which I believe was on a Tuesday, right? Um, if, if there were exempt workers who worked only Monday of that week, the employers, the employers were required to pay for the entire week, even if it was only Monday of that week. And if you have exempt workers who are wo working remotely, you don't need to be tracking the time that they're worked because if they work any part of a week, you have to pay them for the whole week, but you have to know that they're working so that you can pay them. If an exempt worker is only working part of a week, you have to pay them for the whole week. You can deduct from their leave banks in order to pay them. In other words, if they have accrued vacation or sick time, and even if they don't have enough left over to cover for that whole week, you can reduce their leave banks, but you still have to pay them. One important uh, tip to remember is whether it's a time of emergency or not, you can never make a partial day deduction for an exempt worker. And if you do so, you risk the loss of the exemption, meaning that they were, could have been properly classified as exempt. If you deduct them for a partial day during a disaster, they are now going to be considered a non-exempt worker who's entitled to pay for every hour worked and overtime for every hour over 40. The uh, primary leave law that comes into play during a disaster is the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. Generally speaking, it allows up to 12 hours of unpaid leave where their job remains intact. And if an employee suffers a serious health condition, let's say uh, is injured in the course of a disaster or has an immediate family member who is injured and suffers a serious health condition, they may take up to 12 weeks of leave that leave is unpaid unless your policies provide otherwise. But this is one of the laws that, that's important to be mindful of when leave comes up during a disaster. Military leave is another one. You may have some employees who are members of uh, the National Guard or some other emergency services organization and even if they are, are not able to give you the proper notice that they're going to be on leave, you have to Take whatever you can get, whether it's verbal, whether it's after the fact, and you have to permit them to go on their leave, and you may not terminate them while they're on that leave, because that leave would be protected under USERA. Employee handbooks are an extremely important tool. I have a lot of clients who are reluctant to make them so expansive, thinking that the employer is obligating themselves to things that 
they may not otherwise want to and that they're doing it in writing. I view employee handbooks as a tool for employers and if well written can provide excellent defenses in all kinds of litigations. With respect to emergency preparedness, I think it's very important to have your emergency procedures set forth in a handbook. Make sure that that handbook is updated regularly and distributed to everyone. Describe the way that you're going to communicate with employees during disasters in the handbook and explain what they can expect in terms of pay during any type of emergency, whether it's because they can't make it to the office, the business is interrupted and they're not working, whatever the case may be. If you don't set forth those pay policies in the handbook, you're going to be required to do whatever the law says you have to do in the absence of written policies. And it's always against the employer. How can you help employees who really suffer during, during disasters? There's a, a couple of different methods. Best to think about setting these, uh, setting these up ahead of time. I would guess these are 12th on the list of the 10 <laughs> things to do. But you can permit employees to donate any accrued and unused leave that they have in their banks to other employees. You can also permit them to donate the value of that leave. In other words, they have five vacation days. They're paid X amount per day or per week. You can permit them to donate the value of that leave to charitable organizations. There are a lot of important tax implications of donating the leave or the value of the leave. Uh, there's no way I can begin to address it here. My, my tip is indicate in the handbook ahead of time or through some notification to employees that there are going to be tax implications so that they are not surprised. You can also offer assistance to employees through charitable donations. If whatever the disaster is, is declared a qualified disaster as the IRS did with respect to Sandy, then employers can make payments, charitable donations to employees who are affected uh, by the storm and the employee can exclude those donations from their income as long as those payments are for certain uh, types of true disaster relief and are not uh, compensation for work performed. And if you uh, set up the right kind of program, you can permit employees to make donations to either the employer's own charitable foundation or foundations that the employer sets up relations with and then your employees can have the benefit of taking a charitable deduction on their tax forms. I was talking so fast but I kept seeing those one minute signs. I guess we're going to take questions at the we'll end. Questions okay, thank you. After the issues of who works and how do we compensate them and take care of them during the course of an emergency, the next probably vital issue is where do we work? Uh, the issue of locations and alternative workspace is a very, very vital one that we saw not only during Sandy, but during the blackout, after 9-11, and in the bombing at the World Trade Center just here in New York. Imagine you go to other places such as Tokyo where they had the earthquake tsunamis and all. Peter Gorey will be addressing this. He's a commercial real estate professional, over 25 years of experience in construction and management experience. He's currently a senior vice president in property management of Sherman, uh, Sherwood Equities. He's also been a uh, property manager for a major global bank. He's led as director of facilities construction for Emigrant Bank in his prior experience along with his current duties at Sherwood Equities. He teaches as an adjunct professor at New York University. So please join us in, in um, welcoming Peter as one of our speakers. I'm looking for my slide. There we go. I figured I would start off with, um, I like to 
plan, like uh, uh, most, of, most of the people here in this room, uh, for situations. And I found that by making a list and not meaning to take the top 10 list from a common TV show that you mostly watch in the evening, but this is an example of where I st start planning my disaster recovery or my BCP planning uh, with the different organizations that I worked with. And um, a lot of this falls into what uh, Audrey will be speaking about in a few minutes, but it's a, a partnership with the insurance company or insurance adjuster or whoever your organization uh, has on board. And uh, I'd start off, these are vendors that I would get on board pre-approved. I would have their insurance requirements. I'd have whatever indemnity uh, clauses or agreements they want, the company wants to sign. Or even um, my current company, they call it uh, three-year globals. So I will find a disaster cleanup uh, company. I'll get them on board. I'll have a three-year global agreement signed up with them, make sure their insurance is on board. Uh, they're, uh, as we all know, they're the, they're the first responders uh, with Sandy. They're the guys that will come in. They will take the first six inches off the sheetrock, uh, pull up all the carpet, start the dehydration procedures, drying out the different spaces, the tenant spaces. The lobby, starting to take the marble off the wall because all the contaminated water went up behind the marble. Uh, generally, you're, you're cleanup guys. Uh, following that, uh, Sandy has taught us uh, plumbing services, high-powered gasoline, believe it or not, pumps. Pumps that are uh, as big as, as a mini that you will, with fire engine hoses, start pumping out your basements because that's what got nailed uh, downtown a lot of the flood areas during uh, Sandy. And in that follows the next grouping, electrical services. One of my previous companies, uh, Kip Stowski, uh, had uh, 33 Whitehall. 33 Whitehall had uh, six feet of water in the lobby, which meant the entire basement was just flooded out. Like every other building down there, the elevators got damaged, but mainly the switch gear. But Kip Stowski had from, and this is where we learned it from, they had an electrical contractor already signed up. And the property manager and the senior facilities guys were standing there day one with an open PO in his hand. And they started ordering the switch gear. They were probably one of the first five orders that were placed for switch gear replacement equipment for downtown. As the days progressed and other buildings started placing orders, the lead time went from six weeks to six months because buildings waited two days, some three. Kip Stowski was able to get new switch gear on site in three and a half weeks. The full installation in six. Full service restored to the building in eight. There's still buildings downtown that are still waiting for switch gear to come from the factories because they waited three days a week for the corporate, and also the owner, uh, owners of these buildings to kick in and put the rubber stamp on and say, yes, get this order in, get it done, get it done right away. So it's just an example of when disaster hits, how quickly we and the vendors that we already have on board, with the backing of the people we report to, be it private owners, which is most of my career, or an institution like Credit Suisse or Immigrant Bank, who I also work for in similar situations. Getting, the commu getting to talk to the person that says, yes, Peter, go ahead with that $2 million job. Go ahead with that $500,000 replacement, $500, replacement. Get it done as quickly as you can. And it applies to all of these items. Generator services for anyone that's controlling generators or responsible for generators. It's great that the generator starts for you and you're getting your IT up and running. But I guarantee you, on staff, you have nobody familiar with that equipment. When the oil pressure starts going up, when you're starting to have an issue that it's not sinking on the right sine wave with the electricity, having the proper maintenance agreement with your generator maintenance company that as soon as that disaster happens, he's got a guy on site with a parts truck parked on the street. That no matter what your issue is, you have a qualified professional there to support you. And it's really not a lot of money that gets added to your annual maintenance contract. But you should be cognizant of it. HVAC services, um, a lot of issues that happened in Sandy, and we've learned from a lot of other things when the flood hits. 
Everything today is computer uh, controlled. From your domestic water, that your drinking water, or your water that supplies the building that flushes your toilets, once it comes into the building, it's a process to get it up to the tanks. It's a process through computers and relay boxes, or, or what I call control panels, that electrically interact, turn the pump on, pump the water up, and get it to wherever it needs in the building. The same token, you have fire alarm panels down in the basement, and you have BMS, if for anybody that's familiar, a computer system that runs, monitors, and controls your entire air conditioning system from cooling towers to data centers. Usually it's a panel hanging on every floor. The main panel that feeds or communicates with the entire building is usually in the basement. What happened with Sandy, once the basement flooded out, all buildings lost all control. They no longer, not only could you not get your elevator up and down or no power, but I couldn't get water up to the tank to feed to the bathrooms. No drinking water, no sinks, no water. The air conditioning system, I couldn't even tell you if there was an alarm ringing on the 22nd floor because the main hub or the main data gathering panel was under six feet of water. So by having your service vendor on, already signed up for your global, hey, Charlie, get in here with the proper people, you can immediately start replacement, drying out, getting your systems back up online. But calling him after the fact when you don't have a maintenance contract, and a lot of companies, believe it or not, out there don't, you try getting a guy or, or beating out the person that already has that maintenance contract. You're at the bottom of the list. He may get to you in six months after he's helped everybody else through Sandy. Uh, communication. There's another slide a little, a little later in this, but communication has become huge. Um, I have a property over here on 41st and Lexington Avenue. We had power, we had light, we uh, had elevators, we had heat, we had air conditioning. We didn't have phones. There wasn't one tenant in the building had phone or internet service, including my lobby, fire safety, main fire alarm panel. I had no way for the engineers or the security to contact me or me to contact them because, number one, the phone vendor was an IP uh, phone system that he had his main switch down on 34th Street in somebody's basement, which we all know with Con Ed, it just wiped out all power, and he had no backup. Time Warner, Time Warner, they power their network through the, through the streets. Uh, there are amplifiers that boost the Internet, Obviously, when the power went out, all their network went down. And, and same with Verizon. However, Verizon fed their switch around. Blackberries, if you were lucky enough that you were within cell service, you got your emails through Blackberries. Uh, the only thing that really worked was the old fashioned two way radio. Um, if you, we'll get to that in one of the later slides. Food and accommodation. <clears throat> if anybody remembers, from 40th Street South, all delis were gone. All bars were gone, all restaurants. There was no place after 24 hours because refrigeration failed. So how can you trust the food you're going to eat? So what is the plan that you have? I mean, you can take it as it's just basic MRE packages. You can get it that there's you know, food in a five-gallon pail. It's something. It's nourishment. But the biggest thing is drinking water. Um, I have to speed on a little here. I'm running out of time. Some of the other suppliers, you should have security became an issue too because your electronic systems failed, card readers, so you need extra personnel. Um, really quick, one thing that did work, the old-fashioned pop lines, you know, the old-fashioned dial tone, highly recommended, wherever your main hub or your main office is, put an old-fashioned phone line there. It'll always work. I was talking to uh, a vendor, a couple of different people have some new ideas to uh, expand on the two-way radio and the newswire. Two-way radio, having a two-way radio at your command center through a citywide desk, uh, please call my facility manager at XYZ, I have no phone service, have them call me back. Or I need the plumber, I need the electrician, I need the elevator mechanic, here's the account number, get them over here because I have no phone. But the, other, the third item was very neat. HD radio, uh, before I speak about it, we can all turn on the news and find out when our schools are closing. 
but we, can't, we were not able to turn on the TV and find out when our businesses were closing or if they were opening. And there's somebody out there looking at one of the subcarriers of HD radio to carry a signal or a message that at 9 o'clock, uh, J.P. Morgan will be broadcasting the news for um, their employees. Group A, please respond to work. Group B, don't stay at home. Group C, like a, a quick message blurb to the HR point. It's a controlled message. There's no feedback. It's a one-way. And also, it's off the Empire State Building like HD radio. You know, anybody can get it within 50 miles. Um, Cogeneration technology, back to diesel generators real quick. If your generator system is not on life safety, meaning you're not providing fire alarm or elevators, you can actually make it gas. Gas never went down in all the three recent memories of any disaster in the city. Um, external flood control device, a new building and building, we're putting in floodgates, eight feet floodgates all the way around the building, building an external bathtub. It's now required in residential buildings in flood areas. Uh, one of the last slides. Try and get your stuff out of the basement or any of the critical areas, especially number five. How many of have main engineering facility BCP offices in the basement? I'd say 80% of this room, I guarantee you, you do. That's the first office that's going to get wiped out in a flood. Okay. Trying to keep to the time. We'll have questions, opportunities to ask Peter and other panelists questions during the um, uh, session right afterwards. So there's an awful lot on your area we could uh, talk about. Um, Peter made a lot of reference to communications failures, and an anecdote we had was 9-11, um, those of us who were in the Trade Center were not able to communicate because of if you had cell phones, they didn't work. The only things that really worked were pay phones on the street, or if you had a new invention called the BlackBerry. Blackberries worked, a few people had had it. Fast forward to 2012, and those of us who were on a SWAT team for Hurricane Sandy were equipped with Blackberries, which supposedly were going to work, found that we couldn't communicate even with our own SWAT team members, and many of us had to go to other towns to try to find hot spots for it. So the notion of how do you communicate with your own people, let alone your organizations and emergency services, is extremely critical in this notion of business continuity planning. Peter touched on it in his remarks. Our next speaker, Michael Richton, is, going to, is an expert in this field. He's presently a senior account principal at MTM Technologies. It's an IT infrastructure consulting and full service integration support company. He's the founder and principal of Datavox Technologies and was instrumental in growing it to a leading IT infrastructure consulting group within the tri-state area. Uh, he does consulting for a major financial, education, healthcare, pharmaceutical sectors, and I think he'll probably be the person, hopefully he'll be able to answer this dilemma of what is going to work during the next disaster, and what's the communication we're going to look for? So, Michael, please come up and let us know. Whoops. Well, Alan, first of all, thank you very much for moderating. Much appreciate uh, all your kind words and uh, all the attention to detail. Uh, I'm the token geek in the crowd today, so uh, I'm going to try and uh, move through the material that I have as quickly as possible. Um, the communications aspect is certainly very critical. What a lot of folks are finding is also equally as critical is what goes on with regards to their back-end IT infrastructure that supports all the computing. And essentially, I'm going to touch upon that as well, and I think during the Q&A, we can also talk more about the communications element as well. Um, 
So in the 10 minutes that we have, I'm going to touch upon the definition of disaster recovery from an IT perspective. We're going to talk about uh, the scale of disasters that folks are having to contend with. I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology evolution, and I could spend days on this, so I'm going to do my best to try and cram it into the time that we have today. Um, and then I'm going to talk briefly about what the impact of this technology evolution is having on um, corporate real estate. So talking about what the scope is, from an IT perspective, all we care about really is what services do we need to deliver to the user community, to our different uh, corporate staff members? The other thing we're focused on as part of that is what we call the RTO, or the recovery time objective. How long is it going to take for our DR platform to be ready for end user access? RPO is the recovery point objective. So when those DR systems are fired up and ready, how current will the data be? Is it from close a business the night before? Is it 15 minutes before the disaster happened? Is it real time? Now, obviously, the cost of putting those different platforms in place and getting immediate instantaneous recovery with data that's absolutely current as of the time of the disaster, um, th those costs tend to go up significantly. So every company needs to decide what's important to them and what's needed. Service priority tiers. Who gets their services back first? What are those applications that need to be brought back up and running soonest? Um, delivery method. How are people going to get access to those applications? As far as the disaster scale is concerned, um, if we th think back to the World Trade Center bombing in 93, it was essentially confined to a single large facility the challenges were there was a central office in the basement, so it did take out quite a bit of telecommunications infrastructure, which did affect surrounding uh, companies as well. But essentially the damage, the physical damage, was contained to that one facility, and there was no neighborhood physical impact. And then we wind the clock forward a bit, and I think this kind of set the standard for what folks were planning around from a disaster perspective. And then we all of a sudden look at 9-11, and now all of a sudden, ironically, it's the same facility, and we're talking about not just facilities within that campus, but neighboring facilities as well. And I actually had a client that diligently was based in this building right here, and diligently every day took their backup tapes and put them in a vault in the basement of one of the banks that was in the World Trade Center. And they did this religiously, never thinking that not only would their office have an issue, but the bank vault that was so secure would actually get wiped out as well. Um, so the scale of that disaster, which now took out the whole of downtown pretty much with all of the uh, communications infrastructure and power that went with it, um, shifted in people's minds. Until Sandy comes along, and I'm sure everybody's heard this ad nauseum, but essentially what we had there was a 900-mile-wide storm system that resulted in disaster declarations in multiple states. Um, it was unprecedented in terms of scale, with wind damage, flooding, loss of utilities, blocked roadways, no public transportation, and shortages of fuel. Um, and it was just a tropical storm by the time it actually reached us. That's the other thing to keep in mind. It wasn't actually a hurricane when it reached New York City. So what scale of disaster does one prepare for? And every company needs to look at that, look at what their operational footprints are, and then ultimately come up with a um, program that is appropriate for the scale of their operation and the critical assets that need to be protected. And obviously, the larger the scale, the greater the cost. Let's talk about the technology evolution for a little bit. And essentially, if we look at this list of technologies that I've put up there, each one of these technologies were game changers. They were paradigm shifts in what we were doing prior. The original IBM PC standard, a business that created a standard for business um, PC platforms. MS-DOS or Windows created a standard operating system that all of a sudden everybody could leverage. 
Um, Lotus 1, 2, 3 was the first major spreadsheet that everybody could actually use and exchange files with other people and have consistency and compatibility. Local area networks, the abilities uh, for computers to intercommunicate and share data. The World Wide Web, all of a sudden it goes global and we can now post something and it's accessible from every corner of the planet. The high-speed WAN, a lot of fiber optic cable was buried in the streets and enabled high-speed communications uh, across wider areas, which uh, added a whole lot more flexibility. And finally, the biggest one, in conjunction with the high-speed WAN, is this virtualization technology. And essentially, there's virtualization at different levels, as at the end user level, there's the server level, and then there's the storage level. And really, what that is all about is it's driven by the increasing power of the hardware that became available. Essentially, the power of the servers far outstripped the resources that individual applications needed. So the old model of running a single um, server on a single piece of hardware didn't make sense anymore. It just wasn't efficient. Now, if we look at Moore's law, uh, Moore's law we can see how the size of a CPU shrank in 10-year intervals um, going from left to right. And pretty much what we have today, something like that, which contains pushing 2 billion plus transistors and is capable of enormous computing power uh, and actually putting multiple CPUs on a single piece of silicon substrate. So the amount of processing we can now do in a single box is enormous. So what does that do? Basically allows us to take what was a tightly coupled relationship between a server, the operating system it was running on, and the piece of hardware that it was running on, and all of a sudden separate them out and say, okay, we don't want to just run a single application, the HR application, the accounting application on an individual piece of hardware. What we want to do is be able to stack multiple application um, and operating system combinations onto a single piece of hardware, but at the same time, we don't want the HR system crashing to take down the accounting package. So we need to create this environment where these systems can run side by side on the same physical piece of hardware, and yet neither of the two know that the other exists. There's no contention for resources. They're all being satisfied. So what does virtualization do? It creates that partitioning. Essentially, you can split up that one physical box into multiple um, virtual boxes. It encapsulates it. Essentially, a server now just becomes a big file that's sitting on this piece of hardware, and it's running. And to create or recreate that server is as simple as just copying that file, copying what's called a server image. It isolates it, meaning they can run independently of each other on the same piece of hardware without interfering with each other's operation. And the great thing about this is it's hardware independent. Because you've got this layer, this virtualization layer, which they call a hypervisor, sitting on top of the hardware, you can move this server, which is just this file, from one physical box to another. And as long as it's running the same hypervisor software, it doesn't matter that you moved it across from one machine type to another. It's all compatible. So essentially, you're decoupling where the information lives from how it is accessed. What this underlying technology does for us is it creates a platform for what we call cloud computing. And that word cloud has been used an awful lot. And different folks have a different understanding as to what the cloud means. But essentially, if you take a data center that's fixed in size, and uh, we've got... Um, resources there, compute resources and storage resources that we can put to our use. Um, essentially, what happens is we are limited in terms of how flexible and how elastic that environment is because we need to now start adding cabinets, power, cooling, etc. On the other hand, if we go to a cloud provider, and there's some names up there, Amazon.com is one of them, Salesforce is another, Terramark, et cetera. These are companies that can provide you with servers on demand such that you can fire them up, tear them down, 
as and when you need to, and you just pay while you're using them. A meter runs, it sees what resources you're using, and basically this provides you with an almost infinite capacity and elastic efficiency. So essentially it allows your data center to scale without you having to make any investment in all of the stuff that we all love so much, those servers with those cabinets and all the cabling and the power and the cooling, etc. So what is the impact on corporate real estate of all this? Essentially, business operations ultimately depends on the information technology infrastructure, which in turn sits on the physical infrastructure. And that's what the real estate folks have to ultimately provide for if you're going to have your own uh, data center facilities. And those are all the bits and pieces that go into all of this. And I'm not going to get into that in detail. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, but essentially, it's a bit of a headache, and it's always a long lead item. So to get around all of that, these technologies that we talked about, the virtualization and ultimately the cloud services that these providers can um, give you, that you can subscribe to, um, have different impacts. So let's talk through them. The traditional server platforms, they're client-owned. You need to have data center space, um, and it could be in a client-owned facility, or it could be in a colo facility where you're renting a, signal, a single cabinet, for example, but you still have to enter into a lease for all of that. There's a term, etc. cetera. Um, it's very inefficient, it's inflexible, and it's hard to scale. Private clouds basically are where clients are building their own systems, but essentially they're using cloud-based technology. So all that virtualization stuff that we talked about earlier is essentially the underpinnings of that architecture. And um, the, as I say, the client owns the equipment. Uh, you still need the data center space. Again, it could be your own facility or a colo. And it provides all the efficiencies and benefits of cloud technology, but the client is fully responsible for the care and feeding. Hosted private cloud, that's where you go to a cloud provider and you say to them, I need 10 servers. And they'll fire them up, they'll give you the amount of CPU power you need, the amount of memory, the amount of storage space that you need, and you can then operate on all of that. You don't have to worry about any real estate at all, you don't have to buy any equipment, um, and it can be a hybrid support model from that perspective. The cloud provider is responsible for certain aspects of support, and the client is responsible for other aspects. And finally, we've got the public cloud. And that's the Amazon.com, which is out there. If you need 300 servers tomorrow in order to run a weather model or uh, some sort of uh, DNA modeling exercise, you can send your data up there. You can fire up 300 servers. You can crank your calculation, take your finished model back, shut down all those servers, and you pay the bill for using 400 servers for X many CPU minutes, and you're done without having to swing any hammers or sign any leases. So that type of elasticity is tremendously appealing. A lot of people are looking at that because it's very cost effective. Right now, the biggest concern with that is security. Um, and ultimately, there's no real estate involved in that model at all. So the costs on that model are extremely compelling, and that's what everybody is waiting with bated breath to see when that is going to actually reach that level of uh, robustness where that security concern can be satisfied. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, very much for that. Um, I'm going to make a bold statement, and that is that during a disaster, your insurance agent or your risk manager is going to be your best friend. Um, and I don't make that um, superfluously because in our example in 1993, after the bombing at the World Trade Center, uh, our firm, Dean Witter, was shut down for three weeks, not because of the bomb itself, but the fact is that the smoke from the explosion went through the towers, acting as a chimney, and shut down all our computers. Our risk manager called our insurance agent our insurance agent said, well, we have the group of people who could do it, who could fix this. Unfortunately, right now, they're in the North Sea on top of an oil platform putting out oil fires. 
Three days later, they showed up, and they went through and scrubbed out the entire tower so that our computers could get up the day that it had to run. This is just one service that's provided or can be provided by an insurance company. Peter's remarks in this top 10 list, I know this is your number 10 or number 9, disaster recovery services is one of these things that your insurance agent, your risk manager can help you with during a disaster. Now, the world of insurance to most people, particularly commercial insurance, is a mystery. People don't understand the CP stuff, the, the causes of loss or risks, et cetera, and all. Fortunately, we have an expert on that. Audrey Churchill is a vice president and director with Aon Risk Solutions. Um, she has over 27 years of experience in this industry, primarily on property and casualty underwriting. She has a bachelor's degree in chemistry and economics from Union College. She also has designations as an associate in risk management, certified insurance counselor, and certified risk manager. So Audrey, help us with some of the mystery in this. Thank you. And the first thing I'm going to need help with is <laughs> getting myself uh, up to par as far as uh, this goes. Um, this is not my. Oh, here. So, you could help me with this. Where am I? Oh, damn. I don't have the new, uh, the new word version. Okay. Okay, so as an insurance broker, um, you know, we get involved with most of our clients with their business continuity plans sort of after the fact or once they put all of the things together that the prior speakers have um, spoken to everyone about. So um, I'm going to just skip ahead to the section where... Um, we just go into what some of the things that you want to do after you've had a chance to make all of your preparations, after you've actually come up with what your business continuity plan is, then you want to sit down and you want to do a little bit of an estimate of some of your costs. You want to look at the expenses. You want to look at what uh, sources of funds you're going to have in order to meet the requirements of your business continuity plan. So you're going to look at the things that are going to be insurable. You're going to look at the things that are not going to be insurable. And you're going to find a way to arrange for the funding for being able to access those monies when they're needed. As uh, Peter mentioned, you know, if you're, you're going to be calling someone to come to your facility to provide a service and they don't have an open purchase order or they don't have the ability to immediately begin work because someone has to sign off on the funding and the monies have to be go through several levels of approval before you know actually someone can be hired and you are now three days into your disaster recovery you're going to be at the the back of the list in terms of being able to get services up and running um, also, after you've now set aside the funding for the uninsurable things or the things that you're going to have to immediately uh, pay for, you, you're, you're going to also want to sit down with your insurance broker to review your policy coverages, your limits, your deductibles, the costs that you may have to come up with up front, and make adjustments where you can. Um, you know, there are things that your disaster recovery plan might say your, your, say for instance, your recovery time objective is you'll be back up and running in a week. Well, what is your deductible for getting back up and running and how do those two things align with one another? So, and, and this is usually sort of an afterthought for most people when they're working with their broker is not to have touched on those kinds of questions. You also wanna identify within your policies when you go through that review with your broker any coverages you have in the policy that will actually help to pay for the costs that occur after the loss. And, and one of those things, as Peter mentioned, is, for, for instance, at Aon, we have a, a, a 
group of us or a, a division that we call Aon Rapid Response. Those folks can come in. You can actually hire them. There's a retainer that you pay annually to retain them, and they get people on the ground and up and running and to your loss and help with the loss mitigation, as well as they have a team of people who can help with doing claims preparation. So you want to identify any coverages you have in your policies for those particular services. Um, So at, if, now you go through and you thoroughly review the policy. You have to understand what your coverage triggers are in those policies. So what triggers coverage for a hurricane? Um, when does the actual coverage begin? In a, in a property type policy, most property policies out there, almost all of the coverages in that policy are triggered by some sort of physical damage happening at a location that affects your operation. So you have, if the case where you're a real estate owner and you're a building owner, it's a little bit simple because you have a location that's fixed and you have physical damage, it happens there. But for the people who are tenants in those buildings, you're not the owner of the building. You don't have physical damage perhaps to your operation because you're on a higher floor or whatever. So you kind of have to understand whether or not coverage for something that happens at the premises is actually triggered under your policy. So that's something that I think everyone that we work with, um, you know, can, everyone can do a better job at, at sort of understanding those things. And also the definitions of what those coverages are and what, what is the definition of, say, um, tier one, if you have wind, a uh, hurricane coming and you have uh, wind damage that's, that's going to happen. Well, uh, for s some policies have named storm um, provisions where they specifically say for any storm that's named, and if you're located in tier one, your coverage is dramatically reduced. You have sublimits in the policy. You have different deductibles that apply. You have a, a litany of different things that, that get into the details within your policy. And as they say, the devil is always in the details. So if you don't know the details, then you're going to be dealing with the devil pretty soon. Uh, so, so property is, is really straightforward because you have a physical loss that happens, you have something that directly results from something physical, and now you're going to get into liability type claims, um, which you know, I can touch on what Ellen said earlier about your employment practices liability, your general liability, your, you know, different things that can happen uh, with people driving, um, you know, um, uh, workers and, and the uh, you know, benefits they might be getting on the work comp side of it. But, you know, really keying in on the fact that you can, the insurance policies that are out there can help you in addressing some of these things. For instance, if you buy an EPLI policy, which is an employment practices liability policy, most of the carriers will provide um, services on the risk management side to work with your firm and, and, and perhaps a law firm to go over your employee handbook. You know, make sure that you've got all of the elements in there that are needed so that you don't end up having to accept what the government says, the law says, you're going to be stuck with if you don't have those things in place. Um, then, you, you know, you get into the crisis type management issues that you have to deal with when your professional uh, errors and omissions is on the line. Like, how do you protect the reputation of the firm? If something happens and your firm, if you're whatever type of firm you are, you're a real estate firm, you're, uh, you know, you have real estate professionals who are licensed people, you have, um, if you're, I deal with mostly law firms in our professional services division, you have law firms who, you know, how quickly you can respond to a crisis uh, will, you know, help to retain your customers and help to keep you from, you know, losing your income sources. And then, you know, lastly, we'll get into just a quick cyber because everybody thinks of the cyber issue, but for, from a broker standpoint, it's really about privacy and security, be that on the internet, be that in your written publications, be that with people who might get on the television and be interviewed in a, on a show or and say something verbally. So, you know, there are coverages that you want to look at out there um, that would pertain to cyber, but would also uh, pertain to different types of 
liability lawsuits that might come out of other things that you do. And, and so one of those other types of policies might be a media liability type policy or something like that. So the important thing with all of those policies and all of the things that you go over with your broker is to really understand the coverages, the triggers, the definitions, but then also the deduct deductibles and the retentions that you're going to have to deal with. Um, so if you have a deductible, say, on flood, and it's a percentage deductible, you have to understand how that percentage deductible is going to apply. Is it going to, most people will think, well, I'm going to pay a percentage of my loss. Well, not usually. Usually you're going to pay a percentage of what was at risk. So if you have a $10 million building and you have a 5% deductible, your deductible is going to be 5% of the $10 million, not of the, of the actual loss. You might have a partial loss, and so you're thinking, oh, I'm just going to pay 5%. That's a small <coughs> amount, but actually that's not probably how your policy reads. So you really have to read those policies. And, you know, I make a joke when I see my clients and I deliver their policies and I say, if you're, really, if you're having trouble sleeping, pull this book of policies out, start reading it, and you'll fall right off to sleep. And, and that's my standard joke, but the truth is they, they really need to read the policies and go through all of the details within those policies. Um, so then, you know, at the last, I guess, part of the business continuity plan that we might get involved in as brokers is, you know, just making sure that you've, de you know, designated a team of people who are going to be in charge, who are going to have the authority and the ability to immediately start doing what it is that your business continuity plan says you need to do. You know, they, they have the ability to write the checks, you know, start using the funds, and they don't have to call up three levels of approval to start accessing those funds. And maybe that's a line of credit that you have. Maybe that's actual funds set aside in an in a, in a account. Um, but you have to be able to access that account too. So if, you, if you're going to use electronic means and everything is shut down, you know, it's going to get a little bit difficult. So you have to think about those things and have the right people. People who are decisive too, you know, who, who really feel comfortable in making the decisions and moving forward. Um, so then you also have to make sure that, that those people have the resources they need. So, uh, you know, they have a laptop, they have a dedicated internet source, they have the ability to use electricity when needed. So some of your key people, people who might be on a SWAT team, actually have generators at their homes if that's where they're going to be, if that's going to be where they're commanding things from or wherever you might set up a separate command center where they report to. It's really amazing to me for a lot of our clients where they're setting up, say, a, a hot site or, you know, they're duplicating their um, computer systems at another site and they place that hot site close to someone's house, maybe out on Long Island. And their officers are in the city and so if we have a hurricane, not only is the hot site going to be wiped out, but their Manhattan office is going to be wiped out. But the reason they set the site up there is because it was convenient for that person to get there because they really didn't think about, well, what are the different perils that we might have happen if there's a hurricane, is that really the best place to locate the hot site? So, so taking that all into consideration, but also making sure that the people who are going to be working on that actually have all of the dedicated resources that they need. And then, and then this one is really important, and Peter again and many of the other speakers spoke about, but it's also <laughs> contracting with the vendors ahead of time. and. Putting that as an embedded cost into your business continuity plan, you know, you know, pay the retainer up front, um, you know, just put that into your total cost of risk, whatever, you know, your objective is, and, and really make sure that that's understood. Um, so also making sure you have emergency equipment and supplies, you've purchased them, you have them all in place so that when the loss occurs, they'll be ready to go. So prior to a loss, and I was actually at a symposium the week before, the Thursday before Sandy hit, and that the, the keynote speaker at that symposium was Bruni from the Office of Emergency uh, Management, and he was preparing us all for the storm that was, was coming, and he basically said in front of all of us that they were preparing for a Category 2 storm with a potential surge of 23 feet or something in, in that range. And the storm, when it hit, actually wasn't even a Category 1 storm, and we ended up with something like a 13-foot surge. 
So, you know, uh, I guess perfect storm-wise with the tides and the moon and the stars and everything that, that sort of lined up, we ended up with um, a much less of a storm, however, a lot more damage than we all anticipated there would be. So what we did that Friday before the uh, loss occurred is we sent out emails to all of our clients telling them, you know, here are the phone numbers that you need to have for your insurance companies to report the loss. Here are our emergency phone numbers. Here's your policy numbers. You know, all of the information that all of your, say, SWAT team members might need to have on hand and readily available, we sent that out in an email blast like the Friday before uh, the claims uh, or the storm actually hit. Monday before the storm hit, I was on the phone with several clients talking about things that they needed to do because by that time we knew, okay, it was gonna hit. You know, it was a little bit more clear as to exactly what, what was coming our way. And so, you know, we did talk to several clients about, um, you know, doing, contacting their vendors, doing things and, and talking about setting up systems within their, their company to prepare for what was gonna happen. So now you have to contact your vendors, talk to them, make sure they have staffing in place. Because again, if they have staffing that aren't gonna be able to get to your location because they're affected, by the storm, you have to have sort of a preparedness for that. Your plan A isn't gonna work, so now what's gonna be plan B? Because even your vendors are gonna be affected. And something as large as a hurricane, which affects an entire region, I will tell you most insurance companies are not prepared for, you know, really uh, responding to that to the level where we would all think. We would think, okay, it's gonna be a hurricane, they're, they're gonna be ready to help us. Well, it's gonna take them a long time to ramp up and. So you're gonna to need to be prepared for that. So contact, if your insurance broker hasn't contacted you and given you that information, then I'd get on the phone and, or the email and contact them. Distribute the critical information from your broker or that you might already have and set up a separate accounting code in your accounting department to capture all of the uh, wages, all of the, the costs that you're incurring during and after the loss um, so that you'll be a little better prepared for um, you know, putting together your claim once, once you've been able to return back to work uh, and provide in specific instructions to all your people in terms of, you'd be surprised how many people had laptops in many companies who didn't take them home for the weekend even though they were told, you know, we all knew on the news there was a storm coming. By Thursday, we were being flashed by the mayor. You know, there's gonna be a huge storm coming. And a lot of people left their laptops at home. Um, so, and then the ability for people to be able to work without relying on internet connection or any communication connection for a period of three to five days, we think is critical. Like just being able to do work, like if you're working on specific accounts um, and you're anticipating a hurricane coming, being able to continue doing your work even if it's offline is sort of important for a firm. You, not to rely on only being able to get into, comp into the company system to do your work is, is something that we're seeing is, is critical for people. So, and make sure that the employees know, as um, Ellen said, what type of time is gonna be compensated how are they going to record the time that they actually are working? And how many hours are they gonna you know, not be able to record because it's not work-related? For instance, if your kid couldn't get to school and you had to do something to take your kid somewhere, that might be something you might allow them to take you know, as, and be compensated for, or you might, that might not be hours that they can log into um, whatever time system you're keeping. Okay, and then you know, now you have a loss that's happening, the hurricane is, is happening, and you know that there's damage. And, and you know that you're gonna be out of business or you're not gonna be open for this period of time, I would immediately contact the insurance company and make a claim, you know, and immediately just get it logged into the system. However means you have to use, be that calling them, using the internet, however you can get that claim in because for a natural disaster, you're gonna to have to sort of get into the queue or just get yourself in line to, to even get a call back from someone who's going to, um, you know, and if you have someone from a company like Aon has rapid response, if you have someone who's ready, standing, ready to respond, then, you know, they're going to handle pretty much 
the making sure that that claim is in, they're in touch with the insurance company adjusters and getting them on board right away. So then when you're on the phone with someone, you get a claim number, you get the name of the person you spoke to, you, you, you know, provide reliable contact information to the person you speak to, someone who they're going to be able to reach and who's going to have intimate knowledge of what's going on on a, on a real-time basis. Um, and then the, the real icing on the cake is being able to maintain contact with your key customers and people who are going to be critical to your, you know, staying with your business when you're going through this recovery period. Um, you know, you don't want to lose business from clients. And actually, it's a feather in your cap if you can, despite the fact that you're going through this type of a uh, disaster, you're maintaining contact with your clients and you're maintaining contact with all of your customers. That's going to be something that's going to help you in the long run because then they're going to feel that you're better prepared to handle anything that they might need you to handle. Um, after the loss has happened, once things are, I mean, once you're to a point where you're, it's safe to take some action, you're going to do everything you can to protect your property, to protect your business from further loss, which might mean boarding up windows, you know, protecting from vandalism, protecting from the, you know, the um, onslaught of the people who come behind, you know, these kinds of events and try to take advantage of situations, um, steal things. Uh, during Hurricane Sandy, I, I live in Brooklyn, I actually had my car broken into. Someone stole my GPS in my car, you know, just because it was, there was so much focus on the, the, the hurricane, the police were so focused on that that they were just, you know, running through, through certain areas and, and taking advantage of those kinds of things. Don't throw anything away um, if you can because a lot of times the insurance company claims adjusters are going to want to come in and do what's called a cause and origin um, investigation. They're going to need to look at the things that whatever failed. If you have an electrical panel that failed, they're going to need to determine what was the cause of that. As Alan alluded to, you know, you have forms that are, they, they call them cause of loss forms on, on a typical property policy. Certain things are covered, certain things are not covered. So you're going to need to be able to determine what was the actual cause of what um, caused your business to go down. Sometimes electrical failures and things like that, you need to be able to determine that. Um, and then you want to execute your post-loss action plans with your SWAT teams or wh whomever. Um, so you have an accounting team of people who are going to work with whoever you're hired or whoever you've designated to do your claims preparation. So they're going to take the accounting information that you now allocated to that one accounting code that you've called my loss account and you've got all that accumulated data and now you're going to have a team of people who are going to go through it and are going to um, prepare what's going to be presented to the insurance company. You're going to have an, a management team of people who are assigned to work on crisis management issues. So, for instance, if you've got something that got out, someone, you know, a privacy breach or something, you've got insurance policies maybe that have a crisis management fund, um, have people who will work with you to handle the crisis. Um, you have different vendors that they might have you already aligned with to handle the crisis. Um, I remember when, when we had the Abu Ghabi, the, um, oh, and the, the Mumbai um, incident at the hotel, we had several clients who had people in that location and who wanted to get out of Mumbai and there's certain policy that they had where they, the coverage was only triggered if the State Department would declare that you needed to get out. So you have to watch for those kinds of coverage triggers. But there's a crisis management team of people who are handling that situation and who will help to determine, you know, whether or not the coverages are triggered in those policies. Um, so, and once again, the last piece of it and the icing on the cake is to maintain contact with your customers maintain, uh, you know, contact on an ongoing basis with all of the vendors day to day so that they're up to date and, and you're dealing in real time um, issues. So, um, and that's pretty much the end of it. Okay, that's it. Following the 9-11, um, disaster. 
there is an interesting statistic, actually a, a terrifying statistic, that um, based on a survey that was done by Cornet and published in the Wall Street Journal, only 38% of corporations surveyed had a business continuity plan in place, having a plan in place, less, only one third, let alone having a response team, an organization, et cetera. Um, I think we found the need for such a response team either informally or formally um, based on the recent instances. Uh, Tony Reeve is one of these people. She has a full-time job as a manager of global business continuity planning for our firm, Sherman and Sterling. This is a rarity, I think, in, in the world of BCP, a full-time person. And I have to say, working with Tony for the last six years, it is a well-justified um, position. Um, she's held this position since 2004. She's worked closely with our IT, GTS team, the Michaels of the world, and the Peters of the world in working on technical and real property disaster recovery planning. Under her leadership, the firm has qualified as a partner in preparedness with the New York City Office of Emergency Management. Um, she holds a certified business continuity professional certification. She's a member of the Contin uh, Contingency Planning Exchange and Association of Contingency Planners. Um, she's a member of Nassau County Community Emergency Response Team. She's worked on disasters from manhole covers in New York City through earthquakes, tsunamis in Tokyo, Sandy, et cetera. So it, um, she has a wealth of knowledge and a, an example of the justification of a firm's or corporation's attention to this very important business. So before you come up here, Tony, I just want to make sure you watch the wire here because we have a room full of lawyers and insurance people being videotaped. I hate to see a disaster here from uh, Cornet. Okay, thank you, Alan, for that very nice introduction. Thank you, Cornet, for the opportunity to be here today. And thank you to all the previous speakers. Um, gives me comfort to see that we're right on track. We're right where we should be at Sherman and Sterling. Um, my presentation today is to really show you how we put all of these pieces together, all the pieces that we heard about today, into our business continuity program. Alan, as Alan said, I've been doing this since 2004. I've been with the firm many, many years, which is how I got to this position. They came to me back in 2004 and said they wanted me to manage the business continuity program. Well, I was in the IT department, I was doing litigation support, and I really didn't even know what business continuity was. So I went home and I Googled it and thought it was interesting. And I came back and my, my first question was, why don't we just go hire somebody who knows how to do this? Who There's a professional out there, there's a consultant, bring them in. <clears throat> And the answer was a good answer. The answer was that my institutional knowledge uh, really put me ahead of the game and would make it easier than someone coming in to learn the, the business, the players. Uh, as Ellen mentioned before, I know where the bodies are buried. That's important in business continuity planning. And it's a tough business. As Alan mentioned, it's number 11 on everyone's list of 10 things to do. I don't generate any income. Uh, so it's a tough business. So let me quickly go through some of my slides. Uh, this is, this is a, a slide I, I just love. It's things that go bump in the night. And it's a variety of things that we have seen at our firm from 2009 through the present. And it's just really a sampling. It's not inclusive. And as you can see, this is um, things that had a direct hit to our firm. Uh, we had things like the, well, everyone had H1N1. So back in 2009, we looked at the pandemic. Uh, we're in 20 global locations. And so pandemic to us means pandemic. You know, it could hit almost all of our locations simultaneously. That's a big deal for us. Uh, we had things like the Con Ed cable guy cutting through a cable in front of Allen's building and taking down the electricity. Um, and we had a flood in that same building. The day after Labor Day, it was 95 degrees out and they had no air conditioning because they had six feet of water in the basement. 
So it's not always the catastrophic. It's, you know, it could be the mundane. But these are things that we pay attention to. These are the things that we look at. Uh, back in 2010, we had the December 26th blizzard. That was the day after Christmas. That's the busiest week of the year for law firms to take in their revenue. That's the billing and collections week. Uh, we had a blizzard. People couldn't get to work. Financial people don't always have the remote capabilities that others do. And so that even added to the fact that we couldn't just say, well, stay home and collect our, our bills. Uh, we had tornado watches. We had some things that indirectly affected us. Uh, things like the Discovery Channel situation. If you recall, there was a hostage situation down in Maryland. Well, we have an office in Washington, D.C., and it's close, but not too close. However, our immediate tenant above us in the 850 building, of which Alan is a resident, um, is Discovery Channel. So that building went into a very high security mode where we had extra guards in the lobby. We didn't know if there would be a secondary or tertiary event following the hostage situation. If you remember, that was a situation, I believe, where someone didn't like the programming. And so we watched that very closely. Uh, we had the political spring, the Egypt uprising in 2000, uh, spring 2011. That really didn't impact us directly, but we have an Abu Dhabi office. And we started looking at, you know, if we needed to evacuate that office, what would we do? So we put together an evacuation plan. And Ellen, we touched on some of how do we do that. Uh, could we do it unless the State Department declared that we needed to get those folks out? Uh, while we were doing that, Japan happened. And we have a Tokyo office. Uh, Tokyo was a very different situation. Uh, crisis management was done on site there, as it should be. But there was a lot of work in the background done here in New York because we had big HR issues. In Japan, uh, as is different than Abu Dhabi, where we have all expats. We had expats. We had expats married to locals. We had locals married to locals with extended families. We had third country nationals. We had a big immigration mess over there. Where, what, how could we move these people? Where would we put them? Uh, I had Alan looking for office space. Where could we send them physically? We had our IT group looking to see where we could support these folks. All of these things keep me up at night. This is my full-time day job. I think of it day and night. Uh, and then, of course, we had Sandy, catastrophic, unprecedented in New York City. Um, I'll come back to this a little bit later in the presentation to, to give you some real good examples on how we manage through each of these events. Uh, but first, let me show you what our business continuity program looks like. This has evolved over the years. It's not something that I could instantly put in place. It takes a lot of buy-in. It gets a lot of, there's a lot of dotted lines around. And so back in 2005, we had technical DR started. Now, we've always done backup tapes. As, far as, as long as we've had computers, we used to have a system with a vendor down in Philadelphia, and we could take tapes there, and five people could come, and they'd restore the financial tapes. Uh, 2005, we built data centers. Emergency response, we've always had fire drills, but in 2006, we started to bring them under the program and started to work together. And this was really important to start bringing these pieces out of their silos and into one program. Uh, 2007, we started moving away from the old historic method of emergency management where the highest person in the room, the, one, the top of the totem pole, made all the decisions whether that person had the ability or the knowledge to manage an event. So if uh, you know, someone who knew what was going on was in the room and a partner walked in, the partner was then in charge. So in 2007, we started moving away from that into a better system of emergency management. Um, crisis communication, we've always had phone trees. Everyone had paper phone trees, I call you, you call them. Um, we also had a hotline, but in 2008, we brought in an automated notification system where we can blast out emails, voicemails, text messages. We can call your cell phones, your home phones, your business phones. We can call any device you give us, and we can do it very quickly. We can gather information, you can respond to messages from us, and that's a global uh, system that we use. Business continuity, in, in 2009, we actually got really serious about talking to the business and talking to the critical support functions of the business to talk to financial services, to talk to vendor services, uh, real estate, and really have them really document some of the plans that they had in place. Many of them had plans, they just weren't written down. And so in 2009, we actually started that endeavor of getting everything documented. 
And this is all ongoing. It's, not, it's never ending. So it's, to me, it's job security. This constantly changes as technology changes and uh, as we talked, I think Michael talked about, you know, virtual data centers. We're moving away from, we're using a hybrid situation now. We're using some virtual, we're using some, you know, real estate. Uh, we, it has to keep moving and changing. So this is our emergency management structure. And I'm very proud of this structure because it works. And it was a tough thing to put in place. Um, very modular. If you look at the green line um, on the top there, uh, it covers many of the areas that we talked about today. It talked about human resources, finance, information technology. Uh, it also includes things that are important to our business. And this goes back to why I accepted the job and why I was asked to do this job, because my knowledge of the organization. And this is going to be different for every organization, but this is how it works in our firm. What really makes it work is the team on the right side of the page, the SWAT team. Now, luckily, the name of the firm gives us that great acronym of SWAT, Sherman Watch and Action Team. And what that means is the team, sometimes we watch, sometimes we act. And so, for instance, in the Egypt situation, we watched. We were watching to see if something needed to be done, if we needed a response. In Sandy, we acted. And so each situation is a little bit different. Uh, and that team, it's got 18 people on it. And you, people have argued with me that it's too big. Well, in Sandy, we found that it wasn't too big. It was just the right size because, as Alan mentioned before, there were people who weren't connected. I had Alan down in South Jersey running from town to town looking for a signal. I had our HR director in Greenwich, Connecticut doing the same thing. So we had people covering for each other. There was some cross-training that was done, and 18 people really seemed to be the magic number of people to be able to collect information, do an, an assessment, and make a recommendation on what do we do, how do we handle this. Um, you can see our other members of the team cover administration, business continuity, let me see, I can put my glasses on, communications. That's a critical area. During Sandy, for instance, I had two communications folks drafting communications. What were we going to say? How are we going to say it? How are we going to get it out there? I really became the facilitator. That's how I view my job. I'm not the expert, but I have the experts on my SWAT team. So my HR person is directly responsible for any HR issues, whether it be, are we going to pay people? Are we going to assist people? Do we need, uh, in an active shooter situation, do we need to bring in grief counselors? That would be done by the HR person. Um, but whenever an event happens or an impending event is out there, this team hits the ground and I've got ears, eyes, and feet on the ground. Uh, they're out there collecting information. They're, out there feeding me information. We then feed it into the firm and say, this is what we know. This is what we recommend. And the firm has taken great comfort in this, that somebody is not thinking, sit, standing there thinking, now what? Now what are we going to do? What do you think? I don't know. Now we've got some really good information that we have collected. Each one of these folks also has a network of their own. And so it goes beyond the firm. It goes into uh, the human resource director who has her own network of human resource folks collecting other information about what other firms are doing. Um, and that seems to be the first question when a law firm is managing or making any decision. The first question is, what are the other firms doing? This gives us the information and the ability to reach out into the law firm community and figure out what's happening. Uh, in the case of Sandy, again, this team was activated on Thursday. If you remember, the storm hit over the weekend. We were watching and watching. It hit Monday, Monday night. Uh, by that time, by Friday close of business before the storm, we had all of our contingency plans in place. We knew how the phones were going to be answered. We had information technology people around the world standing by to support, to flip over the data center. We have two data centers, one in the U.S. and one in the U.K., uh, we had people um, practice technology support. That is our litigation folks. And they actually have the role of canvassing the business to find out what's going on. What are the active matters? Do we have any time-sensitive litigations or closings? You know, what's happening in the legal community? That's our business. Um, by Friday, we had all of that information. We were able to relocate people. We were able to stop people from traveling into New York City if they were coming to as a visitor, we move client meetings, uh, vendor administration, very, very helpful on this team. 
Vendor administration, we outsource internally some of our very critical services, mailroom, reprographics, uh, message center, support center, all of those folks have extended networks. And so all of the vendors then went out and figured out how they were going to continue to support us. Um, this is a real community effort, the SWAT team. And uh, what we've found is that it works because people care. Um, the practice technology person, he actually called me and said, if there's ever an, uh, an opening on the team, I'd like to join. So people are interested and they, they have the expertise and, they, and they're given enough, enough no they have enough knowledge to be able to give us good information, not you know, what we're hearing on the news is great, but what's the real information? How, how is the building being affected? Uh, facilities is talking to building management. Security is talking to the New York City Police Department. Um, so all of this seems to work really well. And it's their responsibility to escalate as needed. So again, the HR person would go to an HR director and say, okay, th this is what we have. They will pull out the pieces of HR that we need at that time. And they coordinate it. Um, so again, leaving me as the facilitator. Um, in Sandy, going back to Sandy, which was just full of great lessons learned, the finance person on the SWAT team, when we were activated, realized that the following week, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday of the following week, we had two things going on. We had a payday and we had a partnership distribution. Both very, very important. People need to be paid and partners need their distributions. They have financial obligations to meet. Uh, and so without any intervention from me, that person escalated through finance, got the pre-approval for payroll and for the partnership distribution, and everything went as planned the following week. We did not miss any deadlines. We did not miss any financial obligations. So all of this just seems to work. It just, Alan is, um, is a great supporter of the team. He's a great member of the team. It, it, we get information, we get the coordination, and the firm has been able to go through some of those some of those events, let me go back to some of those. Again, in the Japan tragedy, the HR team actually brought in outside counsel to talk about the HR issues because they were so, so, um, so enormous for us to handle. Um, let's see, we had tornado watches, we had London, London Summer Olympics. That was another thing that, that was an impending event. We didn't know what was going to happen. Um, SWAT was activated. We actually worked with London to put a plan in place, and we all just stood by and watched the entire summer. So that was um, some examples of what we've done. Last, last winter, we had a very active snow, uh, we did not have an active snow season. This year, we did. So every year is a little bit different. And so with that, oops. Sorry about that. OK, so we did that. Okay, so two pieces of advice. Just because the river is quiet does not mean the crocodiles have left. And so you can never let your guard, guard down on this. You really need to keep yourself you know, ready and uh, keep your organization ready. And my last piece is a little quote from Dr. Seuss who says, so that's why I tell you to keep your eyes wide Keep them wide open, at least on one side. <laughs> so thank you. I wonder if we could just get our panelists up here so that we could um, have a little discussion and some time for Q&A. We've got a lot of people up here on chairs with microphones. I think we should be singing a country song. Um, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, my question is for Peter. Um, Peter, with the buildings that you're involved in, I don't, I don't know what your role is, uh, your best property manager, or something of that sort. But my question is that you talked about several buildings. Um, in your experience, uh, the landlords or the property managers, are they considering any recommissioning of those buildings to move the 
PMS, the tenant generators, the multiplexers, all of that infrastructure that's in the basement, are we considering moving those to other floors or relocating them? And if they are, I guess my follow-up question is, what are the considerations? Are they you know, moving it to another, are they moving it to a mechanical floor that's on one of the upper levels, or are they considering uh, changing some tenant space into, I got a two-hour answer. <laughs> there was one, my last slide, uh, which I was able to show you. There, there's many things, and it depends on who owns the building. The building is a triple net lease. Um, what the leaseholders um, have, are they in a position to renegotiate for another 15 or 20 years? That, in turn, can drive what the owner does to the building. Answer one. Answer two is some buildings are now starting to convert those data panels, data gathering panels, to waterproof panels. Switching from BX to Greenfield to seal type to solid conduit. Uh, yes, the more um, hip, if you will, um, owners um, are diligent in upgrades, changes. However, the new building code now is mandating that switch gears are no longer allowed in the basement. So you have to put it on the first floor or above. Another thing, because my current company, I work for a private developer, a manager, um, is the current code is also that if your building is now in the new revised FEMA map, which I think if you get a chance, go to the FEMA website. If you were not in the flood zone yesterday, you may be today. So, and you will be required to put in the new floodgates. So there's several vendors out there now that have new floodgate technology. Well, the last piece to your question um, that I can answer is with the fire department and with diesel generators and fuel oil tanks in the basement. Unfortunately, the fire department does not want you putting the fuel oil anywhere else but the basement. So that's why I spoke to Several people here in the room, if, if your generator power is solely for PCP and not life safety, life and uh, safety would be fire alarm systems, elevators, and certain fire pumps to maintain the sprinkler system. Then, when, if it is for that type of equipment, it has to be diesel. And you're kind of stuck with the diesel in the basement, in the tank, and the transfer. However, if you're feeding everything else or anything else, you can go with any fuel you want. Your gas is a great alternative. Um, even some of the bigger buildings are going with new gas turbines, micro turbines. And with that cogeneration technology, you can do all sorts of things. A gas turbine generator, you're not allowed to power a firearm system. You're not allowed to power any of your firearm systems. Peter, follow-up question. And how much preparation is enough? Um, you talked about uh, floodgates, and I heard the story of a landlord tenant who took the precaution of building four and a half foot high floodgates. Um, went to the expense of it. Turned out there in Sandy, it was not enough. What are you planning toward? What would you? What is being talked about? New plan. FEMA is actually driving that. FEMA, with their new floodplain that they're coming up for the different areas around Manhattan, are telling you what your minimum is. It's a great benchmark to start from. Um, to your point, uh, is four feet enough? Uh, you know, if you're just hitting the mark at four, prudence dictates you make it six or eight. Um, back to, I forget which panelist was pointing out, how big is your budget? How, what, what is it exactly you want to plan for? Uh, as we know here in New York City, dollars drive everything. So, and business being out of business, that, you lose money. Question. Well, I, mine is more like a follow-up than a question because uh, the ownership that I work for has several buildings downtown, uh, three of which were quite adversely affected. And, um, I don't know, Alan, if you're specifically talking about the floodgates that we had at 180 Main Lane or another building, but our floodgates went up, and for sure, we had uh, 10 feet of water coming over a five-foot floodgate. 
and uh, our entire basement area was completely uh, inundated with water, as was the lobby. And as Peter mentioned earlier, you get the disaster recovery people coming in there and pulling up the marble and cutting out the drywall and all of the other wood behind it so that there's no uh, any kind of uh, problems after the fact. But uh, my the only thing I can mention is that, as Peter said, economics plays the biggest role in pretty much all of that, other than uh, a FEMA mandate. And we're in the process of refinancing two of those three buildings downtown. And so in so far as we're working with our lenders, the lenders have asked those very questions. And in fact, we've had to come up with plans, be they turbines or gas or however we're going to treat the Class E systems and the, and the diesel. But um, really, there it, it, it's kind of a mess, to be perfectly candid with you, because everybody is attempting to, between the government, lenders, and even tenants, who will or won't come to your building if you don't have your generators uh, above the second floor. It's, it, it's a brand new way of looking at, at properties. And, and uh, it's, it's something that I don't think is really known yet. I saw a question over here. Yeah, uh, mainly for Michael, but others can contribute. Uh, you know, as more companies outsource to the cloud, quote unquote, what kind of models do you run? Maybe a probability model, for example, where you can determine, or a client can determine, how spaced out server locations should be. So, for example, if Sandy is a regional uh, event, and you have servers in Long Island City or by the Meadowlands or wherever, as some people do, where you're, there's a high probability that they're all going to be affected. How do you determine where to locate servers for clients? Um, actually, that's an excellent question and something that I didn't get to touch on in my slides uh, due to the short window that we had was if you took a look at the slide that I put up of the 1993 incident at the World Trade Center, what that triggered was a whole lot of people moving their primary production data centers and their DR facilities into New Jersey. And then when New Jersey ran out of power and space, uh, it kind of went down to Philadelphia, some crept up to Connecticut, and everybody thought, wow, this is great. And then obviously, you know, when Sandy came along, uh, it took care of that one. For the last three to four years, we've been um, recommending most strongly that your primary production facility and your DR facilities from a data center perspective should be outside of the same geographic theater, outside of the same region. So we're putting a lot of either DR or production into the Chicago area for a couple of reasons. One is the facilities exist, there's power there, etc. Also, a natural disaster that runs up the East Coast um, is unlikely to impact that as well. Uh, we also find that bandwidth between Chicago and elsewhere in the country is pretty freely available and fairly cost competitive. And also the latencies that you see, the delays in transmitting data back and forth between the East Coast and that location and the West Coast and that location is pretty similar. So you have a nice symmetrical uh, behavior to your data network under those conditions. So. Uh, some folks are looking at Texas as a potential location. Um, also, lots of power. Don't necessarily have all the snowstorms, et cetera, that we have up here, um, or in Chicago, for that matter. But that's the general concept. Question. Hi, uh, insurance question. To what extent does the disaster recovery or business continuity planning affect the policy, like the, the premiums? Like, if you've got a company with a very robust contingency plan and one with a so-so one. Do you measure that and get into that when you... Well, it, it comes into play, certainly for me as your broker, to negotiate the best pricing that you can get based on your risk characteristics. So if you've done everything and you're basically looking at an HPR or highly protected facility, you're obviously going to pay a lot less than someone who doesn't have all of those controls in place. Um, but sometimes that also plays with how well you work with the insurance company. You know, they have loss control engineers that can come out, work with you, 
And the more they know about your risk and about what you're doing, the better you can expect to, you know, in, in terms of enjoy better rates than someone who's not participating in that exchange with the insurance company. I mean, that most insurance carriers, as a part of your premium that you pay, you get the loss control services that go with that. So a lot of people don't avail themselves of those services, but might want to consider doing more of that um, these days, especially since we've got so many changes coming about with the FEMA maps. Um, the insurance costs for flood insurance have changed dramatically, so that is another budgetary consideration to consider. But, you know, if you're in a flood zone A and you're now in the lower part of Manhattan, which is essentially now either in a 500-year or 100-year flood zone, pretty much the whole bottom tip of Manhattan is in one of those two flood zones, the costs for your insurance are going to be higher. So you should anticipate that and maybe align your budgets to um, make sure that you have adequate coverage. Employment question. Ellen. You went into very much into detail on when exempt, non-exempt cannot work, but what if a firm has in place remote capabilities and pretty well into their, should the firm put any standards or any, do you have any guidance on when people are able to re work remotely during an emergency and what policies may or may not have to be addressed? I think it, it, it's very much dependent on the type of business. Uh, most often people who are non-exempt are not often going to be able to perform their duties remotely. If you think about um, blue-collar workers, typically they're not going to be able to do whatever it is they do for your business from home. That said, the, a lot of uh, non-exempt employees, you give them phones, you give them Blackberries and expect them to be available to you and be in communication with you. And if you expect them to respond to emails or to phone calls, you need to pay them for that time. Uh, so what you can address in handbooks is what type of time tracking software you may expect them to use. It's hard to anticipate under what circumstances you may expect them to work. What's more important is that your handbooks address that they will be paid and how they will be paid if they are asked to work. Okay. Any other questions? Last question, and it's really for Tony. And it's, um, why should firms have a dedicated person like your position? Well, as I pointed out in my presentation, I really am the facilitator of the program. I'm not the expert. I'm not the IT expert. I'm not the HR expert. It's really hard for someone to have that depth of knowledge in each of the areas that you need. And so what I, I know a lot about each of the areas, but could I build a server? No. Could I flip over to a different data center? No. Do I know all of the HR rules or the insurance? information that I would need to know to manage an event? No. But I do know who knows that, and I know that they have plans. So that puts me in the position of facilitating. Um, also, what we found with SWAT is because the SWAT members are responsible for each of their respective areas, uh, if, as an added value, their plans are kept up to date because they know they're going to need those plans. And so Alan can tell you at the end of every event we have a lessons learned and I ask each of the members of SWAT to review their plans to update their checklist. Every one of our checklists is, uh, every one of our plans is reduced to a checklist. And so if I'm not available and I'm the HR person, I will have an HR checklist that I can, you know, give to someone in HR with some HR knowledge to say, yeah, we took care of that, we took the, tick off this one. So it really puts me as the facilitator, and I think you need that person to be the one that's not down in the weeds, not looking for the cables under the desk, but, you know, really coordinating and facilitating. And that's how I view my role. I'm really the, you know, the piano player. And I, it works. It just works. <laughs> I think that's the end of our program. We greatly appreciate your being here. Um, hopefully you will not have any need for business preparedness, but anybody who's been in this business more than four or five years realizes that you will run into it. So hopefully you'll have, be prepared and be able to draw on the expertise of the people like this on this panel. Thank you very much.